And on the final day of the week, uh, good morning and welcome to Breakfast Central. Thank you for, uh, for joining us this Friday morning here on News Central TV. We hope that you enjoy the next two hours with us as we bring you, of course, breaking news stories and some of the big conversations happening here in Nigeria. But of course, I'm not doing this alone. Uh, Adebola is joining us with Breakfast Headlines. Good morning, Adebola. Good morning, Osage. How are you doing this Friday morning? I'm excited about the weekend, you know, so at least that's a plus. Um, but I, I want to know, you know, for, for, for today, what is the biggest story that we've dealt with this week uh, that, of course, uh, maybe excites you the most or, you know, just gets your attention the most? Okay, well, uh, for excitement and happiness, I'll go for the president of Liberia, which is uh, Joseph Wakai, being confirmed in perfect health to run the affairs of the country. Uh, for sad story, it's got to be the Plateau, uh, Plateau State story uh, regarding fresh attacks of 30 people killed, you know, in Mango uh, local government area, you know, in Plateau State. And then, uh, you know, shocking story for me would be uh, Zimbabwe, uh, the leader of the opposition party, uh, CCC, and that's the Citizens Coalition for Change, uh, uh, Nelson Chamisa, who have dissolved the party. I mean, you know, critics are saying, his weak uh, leadership style is what led to the rift in the party. And he's saying, I mean, Chamisa himself, he's saying that, you know, uh, the party has been compromised, uh, you know, it's been hijacked and uh, contaminated by the ruling uh, ZANO PF party. Well, he said that um, giving up or giving in is not an option. So we're hoping uh, the expectations that he will form, you know, a new party, you know, yeah. in the coming future. Yeah, uh, you know, it also questions, you know, the strength um, or the existence of you know an opposition party in uh, Zimbabwe going forward, it's it's not just um, because I mean Nelson Chamisa apparently you know was almost the only one who had held the fourth you know with regards to opposition in the last couple of years. He had continued to challenge the government um, you know election after election. So I'm not sure you know what next for the CCC if they will you know have the followership of the people if they eventually pick a new candidate or a new person to lead. Um, I don't know that they would have that. Nelson Chamisa, of course, you know I'm sure that his fans will follow him. And his supporters will follow him wherever he goes next. Um, but of course, generally, it doesn't look very good. It's definitely one of the most shocking things that I've heard this week. Um, but of course, you know, I don't know that there's any positive stories for me. It's mostly going to be um, shocking and sad. Plateau State, you know, also for me. Um, the events in Plateau State, the, the re-emergence, even if it's never really gone away, but, you know, um, um, killings and murder and attacks, you know, that are seemingly religious base it's 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 not it's not you know looking good at all um you know i've heard people say you know i think i would agree with them that the 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 level of religious fanaticism in nigeria is not the same thing with other parts of the world and of course these are other parts of the world that have the same christianity and you know islam and you know, every other type of religion but the way that it is done here the fact that you know there's more um there's more um, 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 chances that a person can be killed because of, a, of their religious beliefs or because, you know, of the other person's religious beliefs. Um, it, the chance that it will happen here in Nigeria is a lot higher than it happened anywhere else in the world. It, it doesn't tell me that we've grown in any way, you know, and, and, and I don't know if I can blame it on the, you know, poor development of the country generally that has made people not be able to reform and, you know, change, you know, the, their, their leanings towards religion. It's... I, I don't know. It's just I mean, it's heartbreaking. Uh, I mean, I mean, talking about uh, a religious undertone. I was watching in the course of the news uh, yesterday when General Buba, uh, you know, Edward, was talking about the, the reasons, you know, for the fights, the rifts in Plateau State to be a combination of, you know, uh, Heda, Fama, you know, clashes and cattle rustlings. But some people actually say it has a religious undertone, you know, beyond all of the facade of uh, it being, you know, head of farmer clashes. Some people are actually saying that this has uh, a religious coloration. Uh, yeah. We don't know which it is, if it's true or not, but, you know, we have counter, you know, perspective regarding the, the issues of, of crisis in Plateau State. Yeah, yeah and I, I don't remember that there's been a lot of cases um, that have been in the news where, you know, headers have been attacked by farmers. I don't remember any times <laughs> that we've seen a lot of stories in the news where villagers, you know, attacking you know, a group of people, you know, because of their, their tribe. I, I don't remember seeing that. What we've repeatedly seen is these villagers and these villages being attacked and being killed by, in quote, bandits. And, you know, I think the Nigerian government has just conveniently, you know, decided to give it the farmers' headers clash 
you know, to, you know, to, to read, you know, them, maybe take the blame off themselves or, you know, to maybe divert, our, you know, attention from what exactly it might be. Nobody knows. But I don't remember, you know, if you, call, if you call it a clash, it means that it's happening both ways. But it seems to be one-sided. And if you remember, we spoke yesterday with someone from um, Berum, uh, the Berum Youth um, Group or so, where he said, you know, that he's also seen that it, it is very, very likely a religious thing. I, I don't know. Um, yeah. We just hope that the Plateau State Government has, you know, the ability to put it under control. But we'll see you again at 9 a.m. Thank you for, of course, a beautiful Friday morning. Uh, join us again at 9 for Breakfast Headlines. Thank you for having me. All right. Let's quickly share with our viewers this morning what our top stories are on Breakfast Central. As this morning, Nelson Chamisa quits the CCC party in Zimbabwe. It's a breaking news story in the last 24 hours. And here in Nigeria, Supreme Court affirms uh, Sim Fubara as governor of River State as the drama continues over there. Eight suspects arrested in Plateau December attacks. Um, this one, uh, of course, a developing story from the insecurity situation in the country and also Nigeria's leadership and lack of empathy. We're looking at that in uh, which way Nigeria. We also will be bringing you the front pages of the newspapers this morning and the major stories making headlines. But first, breakfast, he breakfast headlines with Adibola Diduba. Hello and welcome to Breakfast Headlines here on New Central TV. I am Adebola Adeduba. We're beginning in West Africa where the Nigerian military says Heda militia, Katsu Rosling and a combination of other factors are responsible for the crisis which has engulfed the Mango local government area of Plateau State. Director of Defense and Media Operations, Major General Edward Buba, stated these on Thursday while addressing a news conference in Abuja on the activities of the armed forces of Nigeria. He, however, said special forces have been deployed to hot spot in the state to contain the situation. And now to judicial matters. Nigeria's Supreme Court has upheld the election of Governor Sminalaye Fubara of River State. The court, in a unanimous decision by a five-member panel led by Justice Kudirat Kekeriyeko on Thursday, dismissed as lacking in marriage and appealed the candidate of the All Progressive Congress, APC, Mr. Tonyo Ko, found to challenge the outcome of the governorship election that held in the state on March 18, 2023. Human Rights Watch says three Burkina Faso military drone strikes that the government claimed targeted Islamist fighters killed at least six civilians and injured scores more at two crowded market and a packed funeral in Burkina Faso and Mali between August and November 2023. According to the organization, the drone strikes violated laws of war prohibitions against attacks that do not discriminate between civilians and military targets and were apparent war crimes. We now move to East Africa, where Ethiopia has decided to increase the 20,000 cubic meters of drinking water production being supplied to Djibouti every day to 100,000 cubic meters. The Minister of Water and Energy, Dr. Habtamu Itafa, said that works have been carried out for the implementation of this decision. He also pointed out that there are resources that Ethiopia can share with its neighboring countries, which will help strengthen regional ties and also growth together. And Kenyan police fired tear gas at a small group of pro-Palestinian protesters gathered outside the Germany embassy in Nairobi. The police claimed they did not have authorization to hold a rally. At least three protesters were also arrested. A small group are protesting against Berlin's policies in Israel and the Palestinian territories, which they say is in support of the genocide. And now to Southern Africa, where the Citizens' Coalition for Change President, Nelson Chamisa, has announced that he has quit the CCC barely two years after its formation. In a 13-page statement, the politician cited the conduct of the 2023 election, the delimitation report, electoral violence and the post-election recalls of the elected CCC candidate, among others, as reasons for his leaving the CCC. Earlier this month, a CCC National Deputy Spokesperson, Gifts Ostalos, sent social media over an, in an overdrive when he hinted that the Nelsi Chamisa-led party is dumping the party name for a new one. And that's a wrap on Breakfast Headlines. It's back to Osage.
Thank you very much, uh, Adebola, for bringing us breakfast headlines. Uh, interesting what's happening there with Nelson Chamisa and him leaving the CCC. It's, uh, I don't know how that's going to impact the CCC going forward and what uh, the next steps for them are. But we wish them all the best, and that's a conversation we'll have much later during the show. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. All right, see you at nine. Yes, uh, it's one of the things that we will be talking about this morning. Um, uh, Nelson Chamisa has left the CCC. Uh, he put out a, a, a pretty interesting letter yesterday, you know, detailing not exactly in the clearest, uh, clearest uh, reasons why he's leaving, but, you know, the fact that he felt it was time to move on. And I've seen a lot of reactions, many people heartbroken. And, of course, uh, there have been questions as to who then takes over leadership at the CCC and what next for the CCC, what next generally for opposition in Zimbabwe. These are some of the things that we're going to be x-raying this morning, so stay with us. Uh, for our viewers in Zimbabwe, you should, of course, uh, stay here. We'll be back after this saw a very, very short break. Stay with us. I want to paint you a picture today, a picture of a family. Now, this family that should be safe and secure within their home, unfortunately, got attacked by robbers, and some of the children in that family were murdered. Now, at the time of the attack, the father of this family wasn't at home, and shortly after the news of the robbery and murder got out, the father decided to travel right from where he was, without even coming home to console his family and do everything within his power to ensure that law enforcement agents are there to prevent this from ever happening again. I'm sure if that home was yours and that man was your father, you would probably think him callous, lacking of empathy, and you would never look at him the same way again. This paints a picture of our reality here in Nigeria. The nation has been fraught with loss, grief, and pain as a result of the many lives that have been lost. On the 24th of December 2023, Mangu, Barkinladi, and Bokus local government areas in Plateau State were attacked, and Nigerian citizens were brutally murdered. Over 140 of them. Over 200 houses were set ablaze, according to the Plata State Police Command. The president, for whatever reason, couldn't be there. And so the vice president, Kashim Shetima, showed up to condole with the people on the plateau. Now, while sharing heartfelt condolences, he promised that the Tinubu administration will not rest on its oars until the victims of the gruesome attack get justice. Well, one month later, and citizens are still waiting for justice to be served. Plateau State's police command yesterday confirmed the arrest of 17 suspected perpetrators of the Christmas Eve attacks. We can only wait for them to conclude the investigation and prosecution before there can be some sense of justice. Justice would mean bringing back the victims, which cannot happen. So the closest to justice that citizens demand is that perpetrators are brought to book and that a repeat of this incident is prevented. Unfortunately, there have been further attacks and killings. Let's go back to the plateau and focus on that, particularly Mangu community, where about 30 citizens were killed in fresh attacks on the 24th of January 2024, exactly one month after the Christmas Eve attacks. Two other communities of Kina and Mairana on the borders of Mangu and Bardinlaki local government areas were also attacked the same night. Actually, the attacks took place at midnight on the 23rd into the early hours of the 24th. So imagine our shock. When we received news from the presidential spokesperson, Aguri Ngilali, uh, that President Tinubu went on a private visit to France. The citizens of a country have just experienced yet another gruesome attack. And the father of the nation is not only absent from the house, but has chosen this time to go visit another country. Asking that the president of a country visits the bereaved citizens who were failed because the country could not protect them from internal aggression shouldn't be too much to ask. The president should show up to grieve with them, to empathize with them, so that when this government makes these seemingly lofty promises to secure its citizens, the citizens can at least consider them slightly believable. On the 3rd of November 2023, US President Joe Biden made a solemn trek on two sides in Lewiston, Maine, where a gunman killed 18 people. He said, and I quote, we're here to grieve with you, so you know you're not alone. Biden has been known to visit the sites of several mass shootings. 
Americans have now come to expect their president to visit after disaster strikes. And history shows that this has been a tradition that's been built over the decades. When a president visits the victim or the victims of an unfortunate incident, he says so many things. He says to the victims that you respect them, that you see the value in their life. It shows that you honor the entrusted role that they've given to you as their president and gives you the opportunity to be the servant leader that they expect you to be. He may not take away their pain, certainly won't, but it helps build morale. Empathy goes to the heart, the core of true leadership. It's a respectful understanding of what others are experiencing. In the words of great Oprah Winfrey, leadership is about empathy. It's about relating to and connecting with people to inspire and empower their lives. Nelson Mandela said, and I quote, if you talk to a man in the language he understands, that goes to his head. And if you speak to him in his language, that goes to his heart. There are several quotes on leadership and empathy, but one thing is certain, that you cannot separate empathy from good leadership. Dear Mr. President, you know your house is on fire, right? Do you know that Nigerian citizens are afraid for their lives every single day from kidnappings to attacks and killings that some have referred to as ethnic cleansing? Even the governor referred to as a genocide. What was so urgent, sir, that you had to leave your country the morning after your citizens had been attacked and thrown into a fresh round of mourning? Will you at least visit them anytime soon so that they feel the empathy that your leadership should provide? More importantly, when would insecurity no longer threaten the lives and the freedom of your citizens? What really is the value of the Nigerian life? These are the questions we are asking this morning. Nigerians need to know on which way Nigeria. Thank you very much, Olive, for that. Now, embattled opposition leader Nelson Chamisa has dramatically quit the Citizens Coalition for Change, CCC, a party he formed two years ago from the ashes of a one powerful, or once powerful rather, MDC, saying it had been hijacked by the ruling ZANU PF in a power grab. Chamisa, once a prominent figure in the, in the fight rather, against the ruling ZANU PF party, cited numerous challenges faced by the CCC since its formation, and he also recounted the pre-election problems, electoral irregularities, intimidation, violence, and alleged attempts by the incumbent to consolidate authoritarianism. However, the most shocking revelation came towards the end of the statement when Chamisa declared, with immediate effect, I no longer have anything to do with CCC. This unexpected announcement has left supporters and political analysts puzzled, questioning the motives behind Chamisa's decision. Joining us to discuss this is the Executive Director, Africa Kiburi, a human rights organization, Nozipo Zaipo Moyo. Good morning and thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, first of all, th this news and this announcement, announcement by Nelson Chamisa, did it come as a shock to you? And what impact would you say that it has on the morale or the drive of the C uh, members of the CCC? Um, I wouldn't uh, necessarily use the word shock because if you follow what has happened after the August uh, 2023 election, five months back, and all the recalls, there has been trouble in the C, And um, we knew that eventually the president had to make a move, although we were not aware that he would be jumping ship. But this is really not a surprise in dealing with the crisis that uh, CC finds itself. And then uh, how would you say that it's affecting maybe the, the drive of the CCC? CCC has known to be, has known to be the, has, or has been known to be the strongest opposition in uh, your country, especially regarding standing against the ZANU-PF and all the bullying that they have claimed that the ZANU-PF has thrown at them. Do you think that this has in some measure affected the drive and the willingness to fight and to be a leading voice of opposition? In Zimbabwe? Um, I, I feel it's a moment where the citizens and uh, opposition parties are looking to rethink their strategy because clearly the election did not work. Opposition, uh, as we know, this is the second time uh, Chamisa has taken uh, Zimbabwe Electoral Commission to court over the results. And even after the results, 
that there have been recalls in the main opposition, meaning Chamisa's candidates have been recalled in parliament, meaning there is no voice. ZANU has its two thirds. So it was, it was and it is inevitable for the opposition to take a back seat now. And for citizens who are hungry for change, it's time they reconsidered their role as well because the challenge that has been there, uh, Chavisa has been made a god and a, a, a cultic leader in opposition. And we need to rethink as citizens um, what democracy is with or without Chavisa as well. Yeah, but isn't that dangerous? You know, you, you're, you're advocating for, or you're saying that it might be time for the opposition to take a back seat, if I heard you correctly. Um, isn't that dangerous, you know, for democracy in Zimbabwe? If there is no, you know, strong opposition, you know, at least uh, challenging the ZANU-PF um, and the steps that it might be taking that are anti-people, um, sh shouldn't that be worrisome? And also, the claims that, you know, ZANU-PF infiltrated the CCC, is there, is there any truth to that? Is, is there any other person who is saying the same thing? So the word of strong and CC do not get together. CC, who was the biggest opposition, which served as an alternative to people who are fed up with the ruling party. But that does not mean CC as an opposition had strong structures. Because in as much as Chamisa in his address has noted economic hardships, which were derived from the political rule by Zanupia for the past 44 years, CC is a party with no structures. And you cannot run a party without structures. You cannot run a party without a basic constitution. Actually, CC was a cultic party which was personalized and run by Chamisa. And for an opposition that claims democracy, that was very undemocratic. And now when we look at it moving away, maybe this is a is will force the world and ZANU to rethink because there cannot be a government or a democratic state that is going to run with opposition. So it's a good thing when they take a back seat because we need to say, because right now parliament is in Jibo. The question is, have those candidates in parliament and councillors that were, that were sworn in after they won under the CC label? Already we have uh, Fazai Mahere was uh, the spokesperson before. She she has resigned on Twitter, just like what Jamisa did. We've got other members of parliament like er uh, Eric Gono. So there will be a wave of where opposition leaders in parliament are quitting, not to be recalled. Because remember, those recalls are supported by ZANU through a captured judiciary. So this would force us like 2008 during Mugabe and Morgan Swagira's era to rethink of our politics. and. For opposition itself to rethink, even if Chamisa is to create a new party, how best do you create a unified, um, strong structure party? Because it was structureless all along. You cannot survive without structures. You cannot survive without a constitution. No matter how good of an opposition you are, it was a weak party before we even talk about the infiltration that ZANU played. Yeah, so, so, so what, what stops it from having, you know, the structure, you know, that you speak about? Because... And I, I also would mention something, you know, and I'm going to use uh, Nigeria as an example. Uh, pretty much the same things were said about the Labour Party. I don't know if you followed the Nigerian elections last year. Pretty much the same things were say, said about the Labour Party. That it didn't have any structure. It wasn't going to go anywhere. It wasn't going to achieve anything. It wasn't going to get up, up to, you know, a thousand votes and all of that. But, you know, there's people who, you know, be, I mean, it got way more than six million votes. Um, and even with the uh, irregularities of the elections. It was still able to pull, you know, that many votes. There's people who even argue that it won the election. Um, so is, is the structure, you know, that you mentioned, is this something that the opposition will be able to put together? Um, what kind of structure are you referring to that maybe it needs? And aren't the people of Zimbabwe who want a better, you know, type of governance, a, aren't those the structure that CCC should be leaning towards? Okay, so you, you, you're very right because uh, CC won 44% of uh, the electoral votes under the August 2023. And when I speak of structure, you'd notice uh, that the House did not have strong foundations because even CC did not have a constitution and, until the reforms were, were, were done. So 
the fact that there was no structure, they will tell you that Sevenzo Chabamo, self-imposed interim secretary general, he's an imposter who has made these recalls on their behalf. Because uh, by making it free for all, they actually built a conducive environment for perpetrator um, for imposters to actually get in. And that is why we have people who claim that um, they're in leadership of CC. And Chamisa itself, Chamisa himself to date, has not brought an affidavity to denounce uh, Senzo Chabango. Senzo Chabango, the so-called imposter, was actually the first person to bring forward that constitution. So that, that's why I'm saying CC uh, uh, Chamisa has been running a personalized political project. And he has to rethink how people can move in because right now people are being loyal to Chamisa, not people being loyal to the party because it's difficult to demarcate the, 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 the difference between Chamisa as his face is the logo of the party and the party. So right. in as much as people want to move away from structure because they believe that if they created the party in, 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 in timely because this party is... Uh, is two years now, is still in, at infancy. They believe that if they had sat down and done the, the normal way, the typical way where people sit down and they have structures at grassroots, ABCD, that's when um, ZANU infiltrate. But ZANU is now infiltrating through um, technicalities, legal technicalities, how they have been pushing, how the Speaker of Parliament had to push the agenda for the recalls in Parliament, how the courts have been ruling in favor or for the imposter in as much as CC and everyone who has been known in its leadership has denounced that. Okay, so if I hear you uh, correctly, just to be sure, that means you are in support of those who argue that uh, Nelson Chamisa used the CCC as a political vehicle. Unfortunately, it was not able to t take him to his destination, and so now he decided to leave the party. Do you agree with that school of thought? Yes, yes. Uh, Ch right. Ch 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 Chamisa, there was, there was lack of strategy. In the, we call it strategic, strategic ambiguity. His party survived on strategic ambiguity. Before the election, you notice that even the manifesto, it eventually came a few days late because they were afraid Zan would run with it. And uh, Chamisa is known to be a pastor. He comes on uh, spaces like Twitter. Uh, God is in it. He gives people votes, um, Bible quotations. There's nothing really tangible that the opposition has been proving okay. to bring in because they claim ZANU would hijack. And it causes, I want to raise an eyebrow to think, do they really have a strategy? No, that is where we are now because Chamisa has been running an opposition party as if it's a tax shop. Okay, so if so, all of these things, no, just to quickly ask, um, if all these things that Nelson Chamisa and the CCC prior to the claims of being hijacked, all these things they said, was there any element to it? Talking about the um, imposition of authoritarian, authoritarianism in Zimbabwe, talking about how the ZANU-PF infiltrated the, the CCC, I think you've touched on that lightly, but were there, were there any elements of truth to all the claims about the bullying from the ZANU-PF? Also, are there fears that now that the CCC seems to be you know, destabilized by the exit of Nelson Chamisa, that their powers will go unchecked? Yes, very true. ZANU is behind this, and ZANU has reinforced uh, the, 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 the weaknesses of the opposition because ZANU has been in a ruling. So up to date, they have, uh, not, there's not been political will from the ruling party for electoral reforms as stated uh, in 2004. And ZANU has been the one pushing for... for because remember, ZANU is trying to get two thirds of the, 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 the majority rule in parliament. So this works in their favor. And that is why people argue that ZAN is actually behind weakening the opposition because it works in their favor. So ZANU, is, ZANU has his hands in the cookie jar, definitely. ZANU has his hands in the cookie jar. Remember the, 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 the introduction of the current president, uh, Emerson Nanagua, from the 2017 coup the 2018 election and the second election in 2023. You would notice that Zimbabwe has moved west from the ruling party. It is now a ruling party, Zano ruling party state with the military. They would never give up 
for history, people in opposition in authority have stated that they'll never give up power to opposition. And Zan, Zan is there to benefit and is there to create and reinforce the chaos in opposition. Okay, so as, as quickly as possible, because we've run out of the time, I think my final question to you would be, how do Zimbabweans, how do they ensure that ZANU doesn't run free and wild? Because if you say that they're behind all of these things, the number of the complaints that the CCC has made, how can Zimbabweans be guaranteed or what can they do to ensure that they don't allow them run free, wild and unchecked? What uh, measures can be put in place? Uh, for now, I think it's time we really looked at the role of NERA, the National Electoral Reform Association, which is being led by uh, 25 political parties. They had a signing in ceremony even this week. These are the people who are pushing for electoral reforms because until we have electoral reforms, can we avoid such loopholes? Because uh, ZANU is taking uh, advantage of uh, these loopholes. So let's focus on electoral reforms. You, you know, no matter how much of, of a good player you are, if the game, if the rules of the games are are not in your favor, like Chamisa, you would never win the game. So instead of uh, focusing on how good of a player you are, let's focus on how do we change the, 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 the rules and let's let's push electoral reforms and let, may this be a lesson even to the opposition that in as much as we move as movements, um, we need to have structures to safeguard um, our existence. We should avoid having a cultic party that is uh, uh, positioned around a leader because the issue is Chamisa. What happens to the opposite? The question is, if Chamisa has to die today, what would happen to Zimbabwe opposition? That's when you notice that as an opposition, there is still a lot that needs to be worked on. So we also need to build strong institutions and systems, especially in the judiciary. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time with us. Uh, we certainly wish the people of Zimbabwe all the best, and we hope that democracy runs free, fair, and that uh, the people can feel that uh, going forward, things look better in the political space. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. All right, uh, this is still Breakfast Central. We'll go on a break. When we come back, we have more conversations. Stay with us. Welcome once again. South Africa is hosting the Kalahari Desert Festival. It's an annual event in the Northern Cape uh, province that celebrates the indigenous Sa communities of South Africa. The festival is a celebration of the arts and the rich cultural history of this unique region. With dance, music, culture and history, all this breathes the reconnection of both historically and geographically diverse in the Southern African region. Joining us is David Muzingwa. He's the organizer of Kalahari Desert Festival. Good morning, David. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. I'm here. I'm happy to be here uh, from the Kalahari, Northern Cape Province, South Africa. Talk to us about what exactly the Kalahari Desert, Desert Festival is, you know, its origin, its purpose, its significance. We want to hear all about it. Right, so the uh, proper full name for it is the Kalahari Arts and Heritage Festival. And I think as the name says, it promotes the arts and the heritage of the Khoi and the Sen nations. As we all know, these are first inhabitants of Southern Africa. So we commonly say these are the first nations and what they carry, they carry what we all have as human beings as we originated uh, from them. And the best thing to really happen is to ensure that their culture, the heritage is preserved. And this festival is a platform that uh, seeks to do that, to preserve the culture and heritage of the Khoi and the Sen. Not only that, but also to amplify the voices of the Khoi and the Sen. They have been marginalized in countries where they are present, South Africa, Angola, Zimbabwe, 
larger populations in Namibia and Botswana. So this first festival gives a voice to the Koi and the Sen by really exhibiting through art, dance, song, and also visual representation. Yeah, but I also want to talk about, you know, the popularity of this um, festival. It, it, I, I, how big has it grown um, over time? And, you know, is there a lot more that maybe needs to be, to be done to tell more people about it? Can it, you know, maybe be one of the biggest things that happens on the continent every year? When we started it, it was an offshoot from an annual film festival that we held or still holding in the Kalahari in the Northern Cape province of South Africa. And we realized that this was the missing link. These are marginalized communities at the margins of the society. And we believed Arts and Heritage Festival will be a great intervention to amplify the voices of the Koyan Sen. And now in its third edition, the festival is growing. We are receiving more inquiries from different groups uh, around the country, Namibia and Botswana. If we had all the resources, we ensure that all the groups are represented and it's even more rolling than just being a, uh, an annual festival because there's a greater need for it. There's greater hunger for it. So we'll be more than happy to ensure that the growth is more expedited, not only on the core and send groups, but if you look in different countries in Africa, there are indigenous populations that are not well represented. You check in Nigeria, in Kenya, in Tanzania, there's a lot of these indigenous populations that need their voices to be amplified. So what we are doing here is something that should be playing out across Africa to ensure that the voices of the indigenous populations or marginalized populations are magnified and uh, their voices are heard by the right ears of those in authority so that their rights are also recognized. Uh, talk to us about how this has impacted tourism in, in, and the economy in uh, Southern Africa and you know, how much more support the festival can receive from the government. So there's, there's two levels to that. Um, the Koi and Sen, uh, especially in the Kalahari here and Namibia, have been uh, central to the uh, tourism economy in their local economies. You realize in the Kalahari, also in Namibia, also in Botswana, it's sort of an attraction that most people travel to these economies uh, or to these local communities because they want to learn more about the origins of human. They want to learn more about the indigenous knowledge systems uh, that we should be carrying today. So this boosts local economy. The festival itself is central to the boosting of local economies because when we do the festival, there's lots of uh, traffic coming to really attend the festival. Not only that, the festival itself contributes to the local economy by empowering local businesses. Yeah, we source local services, local products to ensure that the local economy is really boosted and we make a, 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 an impact. It filters down to tourism as well, as most lodges and most uh, local hospitality outlets see a boom during the uh, presence of the festival in those days. It's something that we wish will be retained for longer and it's more regular than being a once-off so that these businesses and tourism can really grow as we learn about our origins as human beings, as we become wiser by learning indigenous knowledge systems as human beings from the core and sand. All right. Um, there's also, you know, the narrative that the Khoisan people are the first inhabitants of South Africa. Can you confirm that this is true? And, you know, why, of course, you know, this festival might also be a way to recognize their historical and cultural significance. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that. And also, what will be the highlights of the festival? What, what moments are people going to experience that would, you know, live in their memories forever? Uh, I can confirm that what you said is the truth, not only in South Africa, but also Southern Africa. The presence of the Koi and Sen is known to predate uh, what we currently have now. 
So archaeological evidence is there from the rock art, also from the wisdom of what or the way of life, and also from the wisdom of cosmology. It all points to that fact. And now, as you might know, that the Koi and Sun groups are referred to as First Nation. And this attests to the fact that these are the first groups that were inhabitants of Southern Africa. And the highlights of this festival will literally be showcasing this kind of wisdom through uh, genres such as dance, music, campfire storytelling, all this will be amplified and also be put forth so that this knowledge will also be revived and people get to learn about the origins of humankind and the kind of wisdom that we need as human beings that will take us to the basics of what makes us happy and not what we think makes us happy that is currently happening now. But what forms our being, all this will be really being manifest in the art forms that will be present at the festival. And those that are going to attend will thoroughly enjoy, but not only live with enjoyment, but with a lot of takeaways of who we are as human beings and what we should keep doing as human beings to preserve this culture and also to become better after learning a lot from the First Nations, that is the Khoi and Sen populations. I mean, such great uh, points you've highlighted there, and uh, I'm sure that's going to be very educative as well. I'd also like to, you know, for you to share with us, if this festival is a fixed festival, you know, the way that people travel for certain type of festivals that happen at certain times of the year. So is it fixed? How regularly does it occur? I know you said this is the third time, but do you have a fixed date or every year you then decide what date it will show up on? It's always in January. The dates vary, but they won't very much, but it's always a, a January festival. So people might as well be put it in their calendars knowing that our January is sorted in terms of uh, enjoying the uh, as in the Kalahari. Every January we hold this festival in the Kalahari. So, so that's a great idea for those who are not maybe able to travel for Christmas or New Year celebrations to prepare mentally that they have some cultural enjoyment. Uh, we're talking about the Kalahari Festival. So thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing all the wonderful clips that would emerge and uh, just being a part of the experience, even if not physically. Please send us our invite for the next one next year. <laughs> Thank you very much. We'll definitely do that. We'll send you the uh, invites a year ahead. We'd we'll so love we'll that. We'll send you tomorrow. <laughs> We'd love that. All right. <laughs> Thanks for stopping by. Thank you. All right. All right. All right. Very interesting there. And of course, uh, for those who can make it to, you know, to the Kalahari Festival, I'm sure there's going to be other ones happening in other parts of the continent this year. Now, let's talk security matters. Uh, eight suspects have been arrested by men and officers of the Nigerian police force in Plateau State in connection with the Christmas Eve attacks in some areas of the state. This was confirmed by the police public relations officer during a press briefing to parade the suspects. New Central's Chizoba Anyue was at the press briefing and now tells us more. Apart from these eight suspects, there were nine others arrested by the security agents in connection with the recent attacks in Mangu local government area of Plateau State. It is still not clear what the cause of this most recent incident is, but many lives have been lost, just as houses, worship centers, hospitals, and other properties were burned. Misunderstandings come very often, so th there's no specific issue that you say this is the one that's always causing it. What happened now, you know, something caused it. What has been happening before, different uh, things caused it. So each one that comes, we are prepared to handle it as it comes. In furtherance of putting an end to the recurrent issues in these affected areas, more manpower has been deployed. An attempt by some criminal um, assailants in Panyam district to set fire on some worship centers was prevented by the swift intervention from the police and with the help of some elders of the community and other security agencies. Also, in another development, to further strengthen the existing security architecture in Mango LGA and ensure compliance with the curfew imposed by the government and prevent further escalation of the incident. 
which is almost snowballing into an ethno-religious crisis. I have ordered the deployment of additional special intervention personnel for Manuel G. to be commanded by the area commander Panchi and restore normalcy in that area. Exhibits recovered from these suspects include machetes, kegs of petrol, gas cooker, and other items. While security agencies continue to work towards a peaceful plateau, members of the public are advised to always cooperate with them by providing credible information. In JAWS for New Central, I am Chizoba Anyoui. Well, good thing, you know, that those arrests have been made. Um, I'm sure that everyone is also aware uh, that, you know, there has to be a thorough uh, sweep of, you know, many parts of Plateau State to ensure that every single person who um, is uh, responsible for the murder and the chaos and the killings and the, the, the violence that have occurred in Plateau State in the last, long, you know, long while uh, is arrested. And we're not just talking about just December and, of course, you know, the, the ones we're talking you know, that happened this week. We're talking about, you know, in the last couple of months, the last couple of years, um, there's so much more that needs to be done. I, I did say a conversation this morning on social media where, you know, someone was saying, you know, that we need peace in Plateau State. And the response, you know, that I saw, you know, was a person saying, we're not, we're not just peace. They need justice for the lives that have been taken, for the people who have been murdered, for the, the, the families who have been wiped out, for the, you know, um, um, uh, lives and property, basically, that have been taken uh, due to violence. It's been too much blood shared in Plateau State in, and, and in other parts of uh, the, the country. Northern Nigeria also, if you look at what's gone on in southern Kaduna in the last long while, these things cannot just be swept under the rug and you know, people just be told to move on. Um, so the Nigerian police, the Nigerian army, every person who is responsible. And it, I, I think it's, it's, it, sh it shouldn't be rocket science to understand that when people aren't punished for their crimes, it gives you know, more audacity to people to carry out, you know, similar crimes in the future. And if the Nigerian government doesn't put its foot down and say this is never going to happen again and would ensure that we protect every Nigerian life, and anybody who's found guilty would face, you know, the criminal justice system and will be sent to jail, maybe, you know, whatever, of course, you know, the, the, um, uh, the, the, the courts say, good luck to that person. But if the government doesn't put its foot down, then these things would almost never end. And every couple of weeks or every couple of months, you would hear of new stories, of more shocking stories, of people being murdered. The people who, who murdered the, 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 the man in the video that went viral 48 hours ago in Plateau State, their faces are showing in that camera, in that video clip. They shouldn't be hard to identify in Plateau State. They should be arrested. The freedom with which those people carry out those type of crimes you know, makes me believe that they almost believe that they will not be caught. They almost believe that there's nothing that would happen to them, and that's why they can freely murder a man. I mean, it's, it's not the only one. There's been dozens, there's been hundreds of them that have been killed like that. But the fact that they can freely do, you know, carry out such an activity, have it on video, you know, record, and share it, it tells a lot. If you look at what happened to Rebecca, the, 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 the girl who was murdered uh, for, of course, after being accused of blasphemy, the people who carried out that atrocity also. You know, till date, there's not been any statement from the Nigerian government that says that these people have been arrested and they, of course, you know, have, would have their day in court and they would be, you know, prosecuted to the full extent of the law. And the reason that more and more and more of them would happen is simply because you've not shown that you will punish the faulters. You've also let, you know, situations, you know, occur where you let people who were accused of terrorism, maybe even found guilty of terrorism, you know, back into the society. You create some type of amnesty program for, for them. You, you know, reintegrate them back into society. You probably even pay them monthly, you know, stipends. I don't know if they do. But you are never going to rid your country of terrorism and, and these types of very, very heinous crimes if you continue to treat these things with, you know, with kid gloves. I, I did paint a picture earlier that one of the reasons that I believe, and I might be wrong, and, and it's fine that I'm wrong, but one of the reasons that we might still be seeing these types of, you know, religious violence and killings here in Nigeria is because we still have not been able to develop as a nation in the last 20 years at least. 
the mindset of the average Nigerian in different parts of the country hasn't even grown. Mostly for those who still believe that it's right to kill in defense of their God. It means that there's not been any type of development that has happened in those parts of the country that at least been able to tell them to think different. Because if you look at Muslim countries in other parts of the world, the Saudi Arabias, the Pakistanis, the United, and many other Muslim countries in the world, you would very rarely hear of things like this. But it still happens in Nigeria. They're becoming more liberal, even in Saudi Arabia, with, with Islam. We'll take a short break, um, of course, and before moving to the second half. But before that, let's uh, share with you a quick recap of some of the things that we've spoken, in the past, uh, spoken about in the past hour and also what comes next. Yes, uh, eight suspects arrested in Plateau State after, of course, uh, the December attacks. And Nigerians, of course, are calling for more. Nigeria's leadership and lack of empathy, that's what we shared with you on Which Way Nigeria this morning. We stopped by in Zimbabwe also where Nelson Chamisa um, has reportedly quit the CCC party and we're asking which way Zimbabwe. But that's not all. Let's share with you what's coming up next in the next hour. Supreme Court affirms Governor Fubara, uh, Governor of River State. And of course, right next, we have the newspaper headlines. Here we go. We'll also be bringing you updates on AFCON 2023 round of 16 sets, which is to begin. Welcome back to Breakfast Central. Come with us as we review the front pages of the papers this morning. We begin with this Nigerian newspaper. On the front page of this Nigerian newspaper, insecurity, military, deploy special forces in trouble spots, says THQ. Uh, the defense headquarters has affirmed that uh, there's been some deployment going on and uh, that looks a bit assuring. The armed forces will destroy the cancer of terrorism that is ravaging our country. Troops centralize 94 terrorists, apprehend 214 in one week. Well done to our troops. More can and needs to be done. Supreme Court affirms election of Taraba, Sokoto Rivers governors. Over 50% poultry farms shut down in 2023, according to an association. You might need to check why that's happening. Um, if it's as a result of an illness, is as a result of the economy. You know what exactly that but the details of that story are on page 18. 10 killed 10 houses raised down in plateau attack please disclose federal government charges five for bar loyalists for burning rivers assembly remanded in kuje prison we'll come back to that subsidy removal increases fac disbursement by 29 percent to 15.1 trillion naira in 2023 so it's evidence that, uh, I wonder what happens now, now that the federal government has charged five people who are loyal to Fubara for burning rivers assembly, knowing that they probably weren't acting on their, I mean, we don't know the details, if they were acting on their own accord or if they were acting on instruction. But just to remind us again that it is taxpayers' money that was used to build the rivers house of assembly. All the drama and the chaos that happened in river states in the past months, you know, again, re reminds us that uh, the government of River State hasn't particularly prioritized the people. They need to be, there needs to be an explanation as to what exactly happened with regards to the burning down of the House of Assembly. Who is at fault? Because that explanation they've given, Nigerians are not really buying it. You know, who is at fault? Who, you know, who, who ordered the demolition? Yeah, but I think it's also, you know, um, I'm, I'm not sure how I feel about, you know, the way the headline is made because... You know, when it's stated as uh, five Fubara loyalists, yes. it almost then makes the governor seem comfortable Copable, with yes. all that he was aware. And I don't know that that is right. <laughs> there has to be a proper investigation. You can simply just say five persons um, charged, you know, for burning reverse assembly. Let, you know, their confessional statements, let what the investigation then show what needs to be shown. But I don't know if it is okay to call them Fubara loyalists if you're born in reverse assembly. Um, but, you know, they would, of course, have, would have their day in court and would see, you know, where this leads. There's that, you know, there's also the story there, of course, um, there's congratulations uh, from uh, people in River State to their governor, Sim Fubara, and uh, wishing him a, a successful four years um, run as uh, the governor of the state. 
it started very, very chaotic for him. Uh, we wish him best of luck. So, yeah, it is very chaotic. I've looked, you know, further into the story. And what we have here is uh, uh, the Commissioner for Information and Communications, Joseph Johnson. I mean, the police, uh, the police on Thursday arraigned the governor's loyalists before the Federal High Court in Abuja. And they were remanded by the court till February 2nd. And the Commissioner for Information and Communications, Joseph Johnson, says, and I quote, there is nobody that will be happy to say that we have counted about four, five of them that are in de detention. It is not very salutary. But what can we do? It is part of the challenge, and I'm sure that Supreme Court judgment affirming Fubara's election will try to build back most of the lost grounds. I want to believe all these things are not politically motivated. So all of them are just speaking in riddles. And um, yes, I, I hear where you're coming from, but we need more information concerning this. More investigation needs to be done. And to yeah. confirm if these are really Fubara loyalists, even yeah. though some of the statements here are looking a bit um, shady. Yeah, you know, and of course, you know, I 100% I, I, I you know, want that everybody who's responsible for the chaos that has happened in River State, you know, those who have disrespected uh, the electorate, those who have destroyed government property, everybody should prosecute it. And, you know, again, I ask, you know, that if um, we live in a sane society, anybody who randomly orders the demolition of government house without um, um, you know, proper reasons why it should be demolished, without, you know, the State House of Assembly being aware that it was going to be demolished, random reasons, like, those normally should be impeachable offenses. That normally should be enough to show that this person is not you know, um, should not be trusted with power. But, you know, this is, the, you know, the reality of the situation that we have in Nigeria. You know, where, you know, we, we have conversations on Godfatherism and we have conversations on destruction of government property like it's just another day in Nigeria, which shouldn't be so. So um, everybody who's responsible, those who burnt the government house, those who bombed the government house, those who, were, you know, um, ordered the demolition of government house uh, property, should all you know answer some questions to the, the for the people of River State? Um, there's also another story here that I thought was pretty interesting. The over 50 percent of poultry farms shut down in 2023, um, and that paints a picture basically of what the economic situation is like for um, MSMEs you know, across Nigeria and how much struggle that they've had to deal with. Um, poultry farms are just one thing. They're people who haven't been able to run their, their food business, to run different types of businesses, you know, where they offered one service or the other. Even online businesses suffered, you know, because um, regardless of whether you're paying rent to a shop or not, you know, the business must suffer. Nigerians also can't even afford a lot of these things. Nigerians at this point, you know, are struggling to afford basic meals, bread and eggs and, and the random things that you, you would have in, in your home. And so, yes, Poultry businesses will suffer. Same with other businesses, you know, that, you know, have existed in the country in the last long while. I mean, look and at how, how it's increased. How much is a crate of egg now? It's about 3,000 naira. Back in the day, we used to buy a crate of egg. I'm talking about like a year ago, we used to buy a crate of egg for roughly 900, 1,000. And at some point, increased to 1,500. And now it's 3,000 naira. No, no, not very many people can afford that. Even, yeah. you know, uh, what they call pure water. You know, it's now more expensive. I don't remember, I've never, I haven't bought that in, in, in a couple it's of years. It's now 300 but, naira for a bag. Well, but, but the point is that this is the new reality for the average Nigerian. And people have to figure out a way around survival. And it's not just the poor people I'm talking about now. Every single person, every single person who's so supposedly middle class, even if currently I don't think that they're still a middle class, the rich and you know, and the middle class and of course the poor, everybody need, you know, has had to make some adjustments. If you see the way that a millionaire can run out in two weeks these days, you would be you would be shocked about how it, it's it's finished. Like you have a millionaire today in two weeks' time, it's gone. It's completely gone, and you can't even point to anything tangible that you spent the money on. But it's really just because the cost of living, you know, has significant, significantly increased. Um, and the Nigerian government hasn't been able to change it in any way its approach towards these things. We're still basically telling people to endure. Anyway, let's move away from this Nigeria to other newspapers that we can find on the Poncha newspapers this morning. It says, yeah, Tinubonomics. <laughs> <laughs> Federal government differs, as NLC says, reforms are killing Nigerians. Just what we just spoke about. Mm -hmm. Listen to IMF, w Bank, uh, uh, I said w Bank. World Bank has never helped Nigeria, NLC president tells Tinubu. President determined to make life better for citizens, says information minister. Same thing that was said about... Is it even being able to... Like, do they think that all these things they're saying is being translated to the common man? 
you know, because the government doesn't feel the impact of a number of these things they're saying. I mean, it's, it's, so it's expected that they would make these statements. It's part of, you know, the process, you know, to convince you to be calm and, you know, you know, realize that the government is working, you know, in just a little bit. Like the president said, you know, uh, pregnant, what, what did he say? Was it pregnancy or childbirth or labor? It's very, very painful. Oh, well, it's still in labor phase. Yes, you know, that's, that's when you give birth, you know, you would see the benefits. This labor is anal. taking way yes. too long. We need um, a cesarean section. <laughs> yeah, so that, that was don't, his analogy. don't kill the child um, from asphyxiation. But, <laughs> but the, point, the point is, um, Nigerians are going through it. I've seen poverty like I've never experienced before in, in, in you know, in random people. Every single day, there's a reminder, and this is my personal experience, there's a reminder that people are dealing with the toughest times that they've ever had to deal with. Listen, before, before, maybe two years ago, three years ago, when I see random people in the streets begging, you know, soliciting funds, you know, those little gimmicks that they play here, you know, in Lagos. When you see, you know, a, a waiter at a bar, you know, you know, maybe looking for tips and all of that, you know, the security guy outside. It, two, three years ago, I used to say, oh, I mean, he's just being greedy, just trying to make an extra buck here and there. No, people are just trying but to. But now I realize that they are actually hungry. This is no jokes. And you can see the difference in their eyes. It's not just somebody trying to make an extra thousand naira, you know, so he can enjoy himself. No, this is actual hunger that I'm seeing. And I've seen this thing. Two days ago, I, I was, I went, you know, for evangelism somewhere at night. And on my wow. way out. On my way out of the evangelism that I went for, um, one of the waitresses ran with me to the car um, and almost knelt down begging that her mom was sick. She needed money to send to her mom to buy uh, medicine uh, that night. Um, and I know that normally, you know, they would find, maybe look for tips and all that, but for her to run with me to the car, it meant that she has maybe assessed every single possibility that, you know, could, you know, to, could take place and realized that this was her only option. Um, and so, yes, you know, I, I did give her a little bit. But the point I'm trying to make is how desperate Nigerians are for just survival uh, today. And it's what's sort of increasing and furthering the rate of crime in the country. It's not, yeah. it won't get better until, it until things will balance out. Still on the punch, Tinubu approves 50 billion Naira security vote for five northern states. Naira drops as a par at parallel market, uh, at, uh, closes 900 uh, Naira at the official window. Okay, consider my flight tickets. Nigeria, Morocco, fast track uh, uh, talks on $30 billion gas pipeline. Bottom of your screen there, you can see federal government release funds for second Niger bridge. Lagos, Ibadan um, bypasses. Um, we can also find a U.S. court fines Nigerian blogger $50,000 for uh, defaming MFM overseer. That's good news. Mr. Ibu's son and daughter arrested for alleged theft. Of fact, 55 million Naira donation. It's very sad, you know, very sad and very embarrassing because Mr. Ibu has contributed so much to Nigeria's entertainment sector that he doesn't deserve what's happening to very, him and all the, all the embarrassment yeah. surrounding his story. And you know, of course, uh, Custom sees 4 billion Naira uh, cocaine and arms from South Africa. The point, you know, and I think it is, you know, these are the two big stories, which is the reality of Nigeria, uh, Nigerians today. The economy. Is, is tough for a lot of Nigerians. But let's move uh, the conversation away to other things and see if uh, there's brighter stories um, you know, in our top stories this morning. Uh, stay with us this morning. We, of course, will take a short break. When we come back, we're moving back to our top stories on Breakfast Central. Welcome back to Breakfast Central. The Supreme Court on Thursday upheld the election of Governor Simnalai Fubara of River State. In a unanimous judgment of its five-member panel, the court dismissed the appeal filed to challenge the victory of River State Governor Fubara. The five-man panel of the Apex Court in a unanimous decision held that the appellant failed to prove his allegations that there was non-compliance with the Electoral Act during the election. Now, after the victory, the River State Governor of Ubarra said the last eight months had been a distraction due to legal battles, declaring his resolve to remain committed to serving the people of River State, saying he would not allow anything to distract the governance of the state. Meanwhile, the All Progressive Congress and its governorship candidate, Tony Cole, reacted to the court's verdict. My dear people of River State, 
acknowledge the recent Supreme Court pronouncement of Governor Similari Fubra's victory in the governorship election. As a committed Democrat, I respect the rule of law and therefore pursue the electoral process diligently. Regardless of the outcome, my belief in democracy and service to the people remains unwavering. I accept the court's decision without reservation, understanding that it aligns with what God wants at this time. Our collective goal is peace and a conducive environment for growth. I pledge to collaborate with all well-meaning individuals in and out of government to revive River State to a place where commerce and development thrives and people can live harmoniously in peace. This has been my primary motivation in the political process and nothing has shaken my resolve in that regard. Congratulations to Governor Simfubra on his victory. I extend my hand of fellowship to the government and people of River State for a brighter future. God bless you. God bless River State. God bless Nigeria. Oh, well, uh, joining us this morning is uh, political analyst uh, Opunabo Inko Taria. Good morning and thanks for your time, uh, Mr. Inko Taria. Welcome once again. And of course, uh, the conversations this morning is uh, kicking off in River State, where the governor of the state, Sim Fubara, has uh, officially been declared governor by the Supreme Court. Uh, we have uh, joining us this morning, Mr. Opunabo Inkotaria, who's a political analyst and former aide to the River State governor. Uh, good morning, Mr. Inkotaria. Thanks very much for joining us. Yes. Good morning, and uh, may I sincerely apologize for that dish. There's no issues. Let's get into it. You know, I was asking earlier, you know, what your thoughts are on the Supreme Court ruling. Uh, was it expected? You know, or did this come as a shock to anybody in River State, considering what's been going on in the last few months? Well, to be honest with you, first, let me just say that um, we have just moved out of Babylon into Jerusalem. You can see the spontaneous reaction, the joy that suffused the air. Rivers people are really happy because we saw it as an end to dictatorship. You know, if you remember in my last interview with you, I said to you that uh, Good Friday might be on the throne for a day, but will definitely give way to the drums, beats, and trumpets of Easter Sunday. And when consciousness power means powerless conscience, the former last last but the latter last space. That's exactly what happened. We were a little bit apprehensive with River State because if you listen to the comments of Yeso Mizuwan Wiki, when he bragged that, let us hear it to end, your, even your TV station carried it. They talked of a structure, a, so a perceived illusionary structure, illusory structure. It, was, it, it, it wasn't his structure because he inherited a structure from Peter Odile to Rutimi Amiti. So he couldn't have said his own structure because God did not create new human beings for River State. We are talking about the same old politicians. These are structures that every governor will inherit. Even after Sim Similar Fumara's tenure, you have a new governor. He is ahead. And that's why in their parties, although I agree to, I disagree, they said the governors are head of, heads of the parties. Having said this, a lot of us were apprehensive considering the eight-point agenda, which was contrary to our, the provisions of our constitution. And if you read through that agenda, you would have observed that it was skewed in favor of the minister for the Federal Capital Territory, save the issue of the impeachment, where they said the House Assembly should not impeach the governor and eventually remove the governor. You agree with me that there's a difference between impeachment and removal. Impeachment is just official indictment leading to removal. So, save that one. The governor was stripped of practically everything. All his powers as a governor. It was more or less like the PA to the FCC. And so a lot of us were a little bit apprehensive, thinking that given the ways of Mr. Yusuf, he probably would have penetrated certain areas with a view to ensuring the removal of the governor. And we have it on good authority that such moves you are made. 
You have it on good authority. If you want an interview for that on a separate day, we're going to have that. Oh, you, I mean, you can, you can share, share a little bit with us. To nothing. It's like catching the mist. Sorry? Yeah, if you can share a little bit of, of uh, some of that information with us. I know you'll be interested. <laughs> I know you'll be interested. <laughs> you know, we, we live in a country where the rule of just the rule of law is changed and absurd, just a random subverted. Even the Supreme Court lampooned the uh, justice of the Court of Appeal for miscarriage of justice. Deliberate. It wasn't a uh, misunderstanding. Deliberate miscarriage of justice because before that judgment, we had precedents. I'm talking about the Plateau case. And so we have it on good authority that there were moves to influence the judgment. And it was like catching the mist that amounted to nothing because. I always said, people always say, when people say, we can smart, we can tough, we can say, I said, forget it. The monkey is fast because you have the trees close to another. Keep one tree there and keep another tree there. If that must say, monkey will be fast. So, because he's a minister, and we have, and the perception is that he has years of uh, Tinibu. Therefore, whatever he does will be endorsed. And you know the powers of a president. If the president brings his gravitas to bear, you know our judges now, you know our justices. The, the, the pendulum will swing whichever way the president wants the pendulum to swing. And so we had that apprehension. But if you think that he never made a move for the miscarriage of justice, then you're making a big mistake. I'm talking yes on his own weekends now. There were attempts. That was on good authority. It failed. Those attempts failed. And today we have Sim Fubara confirmed by the Supreme Court as the governor of River State. And that's why you have the eruption of joy everywhere. It's pervasive and palpable. People are happy. It was also on this station I said to you that it would be a grand delusion to think that Yeson Wike was ever loved by River State. No! Why UK was well accepted then was because Rotimi Amechi was against Jonathan, who was a, a Niger Delta person. And because it was the first time we were having somebody like Jonathan, a pure German, imagine as a president, a lot of us felt uh, Rotimi Amechi, whatever it is, should have considered that and forgotten or buried whatever has it. He had with Jonathan through his wife. And so when we came on board and was defending Jonathan, we said, very good. Otherwise, it would have been an ejort town at that time. But this man came on board, and it was a match of conquest, terror, and subjugation for eight years. Why are the civil servants jubilating? The man has tried to turn the fortunes of the civil servants. People say he has done so, he did so much. He walked in the river, said, I keep asking. Human capital development, zero. Pensioners not paid. Students we are, that we are uh, 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 on scholarship abroad, withdrawn. Even those in study of finance, withdrawn. And he didn't bother about anything. He concentrated on construction of roads. Roads, roads. That you should ask a simple question. Why? To fed all line his own pockets. That's why if it after he left, before he left, he signed the Green Road. What are you going to do with Green Road at this point in time? When you just talked about a lady who ran to who ran up to you to beg for arms. We all know we are seized of the economic situation. What are you going to do with Green Road in the past? We don't need Green Road right now. We are talking about human capital. When people protested, those the judge he gave out the contract. When they protested that they were being paid. Uh, 700, 700 naira a day or whatever. Two or three of them were jailed and one or two died in detention. Mysterious. He was always concentrating on project, project, project. What of the human capital development? Steve did the best projects in all, all rivers, not the present rivers. And yet, he did not forget the human capital development. He did not. All right. And, uh, and now we talk the about the... When Roger Amit said, reverse money for reverse people. This man was not reverse money for... It was reverse money for years from UK. 
Okay. And so, people were tired. And I told you, people know that people love, people did not love that man. But because of the hunger in the land, they were just ingratiating themselves so that they could eat. We all oh. saw it when he had a fight with uh, Fumara. What happened? People came out in mass. Fumara oh. did not call anyone, sem anyone person to protest on his behalf. As I speak with you, I have not even set my eyes on the governor of River State since okay. he became a governor of River State. So let's talk about what I'm the future. You, let's talk about what the future of River State is under the leadership of Governor Simnalai Fubara. Uh, I just been... told you now that we've moved from stepping out of Babylon into Jerusalem, stepping in Mount Zion. That's what we are now. Okay, <laughs> but you okay. have here. Traditional, he's talking about traditional lands in, in that city. What traditional lands in that city? The river state, constantly they were being abused. They've been by the same goal. Now, because you have cities headed by, so to speak, the uh, president, he's talking about the role of traditional rulers. You can't appropriate and reprobate. You have oh. a man whose lips are deeply worse on interposition and nullification. One minute you're saying that I will not impose the governor, you come. And he said he bought false for everyone. That's what he said. What is the current so position? What, with this? what is the current position? You're going to trust? Mr. Ankotaira, what is the current position with the State uh, House of Assembly? And yeah. do you maybe have fears about uh, the working relationship between the governor and the members of the House of Assembly? No, 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 no I don't have fears because as we speak right now, only, you know, anyway, you're playing the role of a journalist, right? Devil's advocate, because you know too well that as a lawyer, the Supreme Court justice said, uh, judgment. Once you defect in the absence of crisis in the past, you have lost your seat. The Supreme Court did not, there are no conditions precedent apart from once you defect, except the, you have, uh, what is it called, um, uh, coalition, like what the APC had. So ACN, CPC, if you belong to those, if you belong to those political parties, of course, we are not to lose your seat because they, were, they have this, is it, is it coalition or something that they call it? Save those facts. You've lost your seat. That is Ahmed Hule, the former member of the House of Assembly, who parades himself as speaker. Said the defense said because first he said Christ, when he, who wanted to contest the governorship of his state. And a member would have been to court on the ground that he ought to have existed before cont cont contesting. And he also had, then the second, after that, he now came up with, because of the good works of Tinibu, who, who has just been in, in office for how many months? Are you talking to idiots? The good ones that are the defense. Uh, this is out there. These are not the conditions set out by the Supreme Court. And the Supreme said, once you defect, in the absence of these conditions we gave, you have lost your seat. So as we speak, we don't have uh, uh, those members as members of the House of Assembly. And that's why the issue of the representation of the budget was contentious. Let me first of all say, like you rightly know, the Federal High Court lacks jurisdiction even to entertain those matters. Because the jurisdiction of the Federal High Court, one, aviation, two, in matters that has to do Matters that have to do with the federal government. So it's either between the state and the federal government that they can talk of jurisdiction or aviation. This is a purely river state affair. So how can the federal go federal high court give a judge? All right. That's the kind of judiciary we have. Okay, um, Mr. Sankutara. So if you talk of state of assembly, we don't have members of the river state of assembly. That is Amel is not a speaker. You don't need a court pronounce a The Supreme Court has said so. Yeah. Supreme Court did not say when you come to court, you don't litigate it. It's already there. That's why the Supreme Court had to look down put this uh, just the court of appeal. It's also because the Supreme Court disgraced them, so I can say they were compromised. So you don't need to go to court. You don't need to litigate that. Because Supreme Court said, if save these facts, once you defect, you have lost your seat, he automatically. So you cannot come and tell me you have those members, those people parading the same. They are not members of the House of Assembly. Until the Supreme Court says otherwise, because we are not even the Court of Appeal can, can, can reverse that. Only the Supreme Court can. 
on the issue of the faction. So right now, the contact is simply going to say, no, they are not members. They are not members. They are not. And they want to keep them there so that they can move for another impeachment. against Suara. You see, but God works in a mysterious way. All right, Mr. Ngotara. That's the whole essence of keeping them. Yeah. I mean, I, I, yes, I it, it's also you know a little shocking, you know. Yeah, great I can hear you. There's you know obviously the Supreme Court's interpretation you know of defection as a state uh, House of Assembly member, um, but it seems like River State, you know, or what we're currently dealing with is an eight-point agenda, you know, that is overriding the Supreme Court and what the Constitution says. But uh, let's move away from that. Okay, I, I, I want to. Uh, let's no, move away. Sir, I, do, I, do, I will respond to that. Sir. I will have to. Oh, you will. That. You that will. But I want. Let me ask my question also. It's you. not known. It's not known in law. You know that, sir. It's not known in law. We are talking about a Supreme Court judgment. So what is it? Even Mr. President is subject to the rule of law. You know this is like that. So this is It's not known to law. Yeah. It's not. People are saying you talk of a, you talk of reconciliation, you talk of abdication, and so on. Yes, we agree. But to the extent of the inconsistency, once the enemy step is taken, that contradicts the provisions of your laws and constitutions, to that extent, that agreement is a knowledge. Yeah. It's a known fact. Even primary school children will tell you that. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. So you cannot say, God represent a budget. How can you say God represent a budget as part of agreement? How? How ridiculous is that? And that's why we have this apprehension. Because when you look at the airport agenda, a lot of people are saying, what kind of thing is this? A, a, a human beings, a, the, the human beings are going to sit down to discuss and agree on this. But you know, the hands of the governor was tied. They were all tied. The hands were tied pending the Supreme Court judgment. The hands were tied. If you observe, he kept preaching peace, peace. Now, after the judgment, what has happened? He has said he's not swearing those persons pending the federal court judgment. Which to me was even, it, it's not necessary. Mr. Ngotara. He's the governor of the state. Mr. Uh, yes, I can hear you. I, I also want to ask. Sorry, I'm just, I'm just earlier this week, that's, that's, You can go on, yes. It's understandable. <laughs> earlier this week, we, we had a conversation with um, um, Collins Odu. I think he, he used to be a member of the House. Or maybe, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure now. Um, but he joined us earlier this mm. week. And his views, you know, are slightly I listened to flaccid, I listened to his flaccid argument. Yeah. I listened. Yeah, so I want you to quickly respond to some of the things that he said, you know, like how he believes Governor Sim Fubara needs to calm down and stop being, you know, seemingly stubborn and stop trying to destroy the structure that you know, some wiki had already set, you know, put in place in the state. Um, so I want your, res your response to that. Is there a political structure that is of so much is relevance and importance to the people of River State that anybody who tries to maybe tweak it a little bit uh, would eventually or, or, you know, must immediately be kicked out of office. Do you, do you know anything about this structure in River State that, you know, Mr. Odu must have do been you, referring to? Do, do, is, does that not obviate, yes, does that statement not obviate the need for any further proof of a man that is a megalomania? What structure are you talking about? We are talking about the governance of the state. So when you talk of structure, structure is just to enhance your performance in government. Those you appoint, those you, like you have the commissioners, the advisors, your aides, your PAs, your essays, your your friends, not, not even those that are in government, your friends that you can advise you on how best to manage the system. That is different from that's when you talk of structure. That is different from a cabal. <laughs> What Mike was talking about was a cabal, Germanic cabal, that will lord it over the place. It was a question of least lord and least servant. You don't speak. When you talk of structure, people advise you, listen. Uh, the, the, the uh, senator representing the FCT, what did she say when the when, uh, Mike was summoned? He doesn't even answer calls, nothing. So what? So when you talk of a structure, you say, Look, I assisted this man in getting this, in getting that. I appointed him based on advice. Even the United States president, he has the structure. Those around him, those that helped him to succeed. That's what you call the structure. But not a dynamic, demonic cabal, which are seen 
as the masters and other servants. That's not, they don't want that in reverse. We uh, wrote to me, I mean, you had its own structure. Wrote uh, Peter, Peter they had its own structure. Ada Joyce had its own structure. But they did not force it on reverse people. They did not. Look at the man telling you, I bought the forms. I, I, it's such a man should be in jail. I bought the forms. I bought the forms. Okay, we use money. Is that not anti democratic? That you bought forms? You did this? In fact, it is even wrong to say that you made Fumare a governor. Then, in other words, you are telling us that you rigged the election? It's so preposterous. That leads to a real opportunity of logic. You don't talk like that. We don't, we don't look. Hey, Fumare has come to say, I don't have a structure. My structure are reversible. And Rivers people did not fail it when they, we had the crisis. They came out to say, yes. Umara structure are Rivers So we don't, we, that, that, that's the whole structure in politics. And not about I'm twisting, being dictatorial, being a lord over everybody. That is not, look at even the way he talks. That's not what we call a structure. That's not what, that, I mean, it's so wrong. So it has nothing to do with governance. Structure, structure. For eight years, what happened? What happened? Eight right. years. Nothing happened. Apart from somebody trying to fed our line is open. You'd sit down and drink a whiskey for 10 million naira when people are in penury. When people are in penury. What okay. people did was you stood to conquer. All right. So is it safe to say now? I so mean... you accepted those agreements. You don't really refuse to accept those agreements. You refuse to sign. He thought he was a governor. So he felt it. He knew the pains. Or somebody, if I tell Tinibu today that better two must go back, will he accept it? Then you tell the former, and those commissioners are shameless. You went and submitted your this. You know, you just want to kill the governor. You, the weekend, when you were here, did you allow anybody to cage you? People could not even advise you not to talk about KG. Mr. Enkotaria. Uh, Mr. Enkotaria. You must accept and be appointed this commissioner. Mr. Enkotaria, let's talk about... Let me have with you in this country. All right, Mr. Enkotaria, uh, let's yes. talk about what the future is now in terms of uh, how... I mean, you've highlighted some of the things that are exciting about this judgment. Uh, do you think that uh, Mr. Nyeson Wike will now, quote-unquote, back down? And also, what would you see as some of the most pressing areas that... Similar life for Bara needs to focus on, especially because, like he said, the past few months have been fraught with distractions, political distractions. Now it's time to put governance on the front seat. What are some of the key areas he needs to focus on to improve the quality of life in River State? Okay. First and foremost, if you say if you ask the question if UK was going to back down. Yes. We don't give a damn about it. We don't give a damn about it. Willy nilly. Whether I like it or not. Go back down. If he doesn't willingly do so, we'll make him, we'll force him to show you. And if he's not careful, he's approaching his political nadaya. This is the first shot. Let him wait and see. It behoves on Fumara to perform in the next three, three, three to three years and a half. The man has not even started performing. And River School are behind him. Not because of Fumara himself. No, no, no. Don't get this wrong. It's not because of Fubara, but because of the office and the attitude of Yosho Wike. Not that people came out to say it's because of Fubara is an Ijoma. No, it has nothing like it has no ethnic coloration. But it was a question of why would one man want to dictate the reversal? So the referendum of people's disapproval of dictatorship. Having said that, all Fubara needs to do, which he has started doing, like last year, December, he gave the civil servants some money. To alleviate the poverty, the pensioners they started paying for eight years. People were not paid. Pensioners were not paid. They started addressing their issues. He has to concentrate on human. Let him forget about the infrastructure. Yes, it might come side by side. For example, you have uh, my one now that is being constructed. The people say it's, it's been done under Fubara's administration. Let me be honest with you. The contract was signed for under a uh, week and paid for under a week, but it's just been executed by uh, under Fubara. 
The same thing with the ring road. So people will now misunderstand. He's also going into projects. He's also doing that. No, most of these things we have signed and paid for by a governor who is out of who is leaving the state. So <laughs> that will tell you his, his interest. I've said that human capital development is key. But there is so much poverty in the land. And we should not experience that in oil producing states like River State, Bayasa State, Delta State, and so on. So if you are addressing the human capital development, then I can tell you you must have written his name in gold. Yeah. Because that is what people are not into. Yes, the flavor and so on are good. No, no doubt about the good roads, everything, yes, it enhances uh, economy uh, development and so on. But if you can do that simultaneously, fine. But don't sacrifice human capital at the altar of that. You know, I can say, you, you, you go about saying, you did two flyovers. Some of them are not necessary. Why not? You would have just considered several flyovers and used the money for five other flyovers on human capital development. Then it will make sense. Yeah, well, if I mean, you had allowed it to give you believe... another four years, you would have done another 15 flyovers, 20 flyovers, 30 flyovers. Meanwhile, the people are in abject poverty. Yeah. I, I believe it's also the, the, the prayer of the you people. You cannot of... even feed. See the cars are going to, uh, uh, the cars are going to die. Yeah, Ms. Engotari, I believe it's also mm -hmm. the, the prayer of the people of River then State this morning um, that as, as Governor Fubara has won, because I mean, I'm going I'm to speak as the regular electorate, that as he has won, that he doesn't disappoint the people of River State. Um, as much as he has fought tirelessly to hold on to the seat of Governor of River State, he has four years to prove to the people of River State that they made the right choice by voting him into office. And that, you know, all this fighting is not for his own personal interest, um, but for, of course, the, the people of River State. Um, every single person who's connected to him now, including those in the National Assembly and those, of course, who are going to be commissioners and those who are part of the government, must not fail the people of River State. Like you've said, flyovers aren't what the people of River State need. They need human capital development. They need better health care. They need better education. They need security. They need a lot of all these things that would improve I hear you. on quality of life of the people of River State. I can, and so, I can hear you. Yeah, and so we hope that Governor Fubara understands these little details and doesn't fail them. Uh, Opunabo Inkotara, we always find it interesting speaking with you. We look forward to other conversations. I can hear you. Um, in the new week. <laughs> okay, I, I'm sure there's a connection there's a problem. Delay. I can hear you. Don't push me away. Don't push me away. We've come to the end of the show, unfortunately. We're coming to the end of the conversation. We've come to the end of the conversation. So thank you very much for joining us this morning. As always, we appreciate you. Thank you, and we'll see you again next week. All right. This is where we, of course, uh, will be saying uh, goodbye to our viewers after a very, very interesting week. Um, our hearts, of course, once again go out to those who are affected by violence in Plateau State and in any other part of the country. And we call on the president and the governor and every other person who is responsible for the protection of lives and property to ensure that they please do what is necessary to keep Nigerians safe. All right, let's share with you what's happening later today as we exit the studio. Pafanoa Africa comes your way at 2 p.m. West Africa time. Again time, we bring you NC Continental Prime. And at 10 p.m. West African time, Nigeria tonight. Thank you for joining us all through the week. We'll be exiting the studio and joining you back again on Monday, like I like to wrap up on Fridays. If you will be, in the words of Osalgi, visiting uh, anyone for evangelism this weekend, please remember, do not drink and drive. Turn up with us. I am Olive Emodi. Is it Holy Communion I'm going to be drinking? Why, why would you be drinking at uh, Because you talked about evangelism, evangelism and you're evangelism. talking about waiter, and I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> Um, we wish you a very interesting weekend. We're going to be back here on Monday morning. Um, remember, Nigeria, of course, uh, takes on Cameroon this weekend. Um, and oh, so Nigeria. go Super Eagles. Make sure that you, of course, you are out there to cheer them. We wish them the very best. You've asked for the president to come and cheer them personally. No, he's in France. Yeah. Um, we'll see you again on Monday morning. I am Osal Gye Ogbonwa. <laughs>